You are now tuned into the truth frequency. We are TFR. TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. But man, when young, lived only to eat and drink and to fornicate. For being conscious only of the earth, he knew only earthly things and earthly ways. Hold the Bible. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio. And I have as guests with me for the next two hours, my good friend, Jonathan Clegg. Johnny, you there, brother? I'm here. Can you hear me? I hear you loud and clear. Cool. You doing all right? I'm good, man. Are you ready to crack it open? I am, brother. This is going to be a most awesome show and one that uh, it, it, it's this topic's been needing to be covered by you and I for a long time because uh, we both have, as always, different aspects of the riddle of truth uh, that is contained within the gospel that is little understood by mainstream churchianity. And so, yeah, let's uh, break it open. Yeah, let's do it. Um, before we um, before we get going, let me explain a couple things to your audience as well as my audience that's listening to tell them how they can maximize uh, the experience. So here's the thing. I'm going to have Dave that's in your chat room. We're going to post a link to a venue called You Now. Okay, so when when in y'all's chat room, when you see uh, the You Now link, um, everyone that is listening to your program, y'all should pull up a window and get You Now. And let me tell you what it is. It's a video connection to what I'm doing in my studio here. And so what we're going to be doing is, um, with all these scriptures, we're going to be presenting supernatural revelation uh, imagery that uh, that it's stuff that you never ever ever would have known about unless you saw it unless it was revealed to you um and so if you can go to the you now link all the listeners um go to the you now link and i'll give you a couple minutes to get your you know your window open to where you can see the images that we're talking about um and that way you know, that way you can really follow along um, with the discourse as well as the imagery that is going to blow you away and support uh, the scriptures. It's just mind blowing. Um, and then from the people that are in the venues that come to this program, y'all need to go over to Truth Frequency Radio and that should be in your you Now link that should have been posted for you guys that are watching you now because you will not be able to hear zen um through you now because i have a headset on um so anyway you know it's kind of tricky we're kind of crossing over a couple venues but it's really no big deal it's only two windows one for the video and you can look at that and then just have the audio running through your you know your connection to truth frequency radio and it should be absolutely no problem so anyway, so that would be a good way to, uh, you know, uh, get through this program and get to see all the imagery that goes with it because the imagery is staggering. It's just absolutely staggering. Um, for those of y'all that are on a phone or something, I'm really sorry. You will always be able to catch the, uh, you know, the um, archive. archive or, you know, we may make a vid of it. But here's the other thing. If you're... You know, if you're watching you now, you can listen uh, to what I'm saying. You're going to miss what Zen's saying, but you'll get all the imagery still. So anyway, so that, that's the best I could work it out to make it, you know, cross over with the venues. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a, a live uh, mic uh, set up where you can hear and talk at the same time um, for all these different computers. It's just don't have it set up. Okay. Well, one other thing. Uh for the listening audience and those that would like to see the show notes and all the connections to uh, Johnny's websites and also, you know, as far as where you can go to find the images, I did paste all that 
on my Facebook underneath the show description. And so you can go there and find um, all the links to the different archives and as far as uh, where to go to find the images so you can pull them up as we are discussing and going through content. All right. right. And, and here's another thing, guys. Here's what I'm going to try and do. Sometimes I get a little excited. I get a little bit ahead of myself. But when I talk about an image, okay, if I'm, if I'm going to pull up, let's say, an image of the Vatican, like right now, on your screen, you should be looking at uh, an image of uh, a serpent wearing a crown. Um, and you should be able to see that. And it's called, the title of that image is called Locust Energy F3. And I'm going to go ahead and call out the names of them because we're going to post the links to what we call the show notes. And, and if you guys want to get all this imagery yourself, I don't care if you download it. I, as a matter of fact, I would like for everybody that wants all these images, you are welcome to them. It's, you know, we put them all together for you. And you can download the link and put it in your library. And you can always go back and, you know, listen and look at the images on your own. Because to have these images in your possession, I mean, you have no idea of the value of these images to go with the scriptures and how they complement one another. And, you know, they just put the puzzle together in a way that's absolutely staggering. So I would highly suggest that. So just a little, you know thing to do to, before we get started so there we go and then uh as far as scriptures go let's tell everyone um guys y'all i think it's really important that you have your bibles out or you have a bible you know uh link open um and know that we're going to cover uh genesis 1 and genesis 2 and second corinthians 6 here in the beginning of the program because we want to put you on the foundation and we want to show you how, like, one of the biggest, well, it's probably the biggest deception ever that's been perpetrated on everybody. And what's so mind-boggling is Zen came about the same information via a different avenue uh, that I came uh, to. And mine was, you know, just uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, spiritual gifting. The Lord just led me uh, through a you know, a series of revel revelation gifts and had me apply it to the scriptures. And then Zen did all this extra biblical text work, which is just staggering. And when you put the two together, let me tell you something, there's just no way to argue with it. It's just, it's unimpeachable. So, uh, yeah, if you guys get your Bibles out and you have all this information at your fingertips, it's going to make it a really fun experience. So that's what I would suggest you do. All right. You ready, Zen? Absolutely, brother. Let's get into it. All right. Well, let's let's talk first about a couple words. And by the way, in y'all's chat room, um, Dave is going to be uh, posting imagery in your chat room, Zen, as well as uh, probably Alyssa. You'll see Alyssa H. And she'll probably be posting... Um, some definitions of some words because the definition the definitions of words are critical in Absolutely. understanding what the scriptures really mean uh, because a lot of people think because they read it and they read it in english it means something but the word can have a completely different meaning when you read it in its original language and when you see what it really means and you you read it in the context it's going to change everything, literally everything. So I, I want to start with the scripture that uh, comes right out of the mouth of Jesus himself. And so, but, you know, before I read that scripture, I would, you know, submit to everybody that one page that we all have to be on uh, in order for all this to, uh, uh, to gel with you is Jesus Christ is the incarnation of the invisible God. He is the Lord God in the flesh. And so you know, for those of y'all that haven't made the step yet of, of actually believing in your heart that that's who he really is, that Jesus Christ is the incarnation and of the Lord God. He is the Lord God in the flesh that took on a human form. And his reason for doing that was to save us from our sins. And, and this is going to make so much sense tonight. 
when you see this put together, I, I never really knew. Like, I, don't, I didn't really get why did he have to, you know, why why did God have to be a man? Why did he have to die on a cross? You know, what's up with that? A lot of it didn't make really any sense to me. But now that this puzzle is put together, it is the most amazing. It's, it's like a story of absolute love of a father for his yes. children. It's just absolute straight up. I love my children and I'll do whatever it takes to save my own kids. And uh, it's going to blow your mind. So let let's me, uh, share one comment really quick. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, the interesting aspect of the whole story of the love of uh, the father and the son and the son coming into the flesh is that um, Eve was an adulteress and she fell away. And because of her adultery, both her and Adam were cast out. They lost their bright nature. They fell to flesh form. And Christ, in redeeming us as bride, is coming to fix, to redeem the fall and to rectify it. And that's the secret. That's the connection from the Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. It is the redeeming of the bride and reestablishing the purity of the bride so that we would be as like the wise virgins ready and honorable so that we can be uh, prepared uh, for the bridegroom for the coming of the bridegroom and and absolutely and, and now that zen just said that the scripture that i'm going to give to you and we're going to start in john uh chapter 10 and uh when you when you when you realize john chapter 10 and we're going to go from John chapter 10 to Psalm 82. And then we're going to go from Psalm 82 to Genesis 1. And then to Genesis 2. And then to 2 Corinthians 2.6. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's go on a scriptural journey. And then uh, while we're doing this, um, you know, as I, as I can, I'll pop up some imagery for you guys. Uh, it's just going to be, it's mind-boggling. So let's do it. Okay, so... You know, I was always told, you know, in church and all that, that uh, Genesis 1 says, you know, when it said the word is God, G-O-D, when God said, let us create man in our image, you know, uh, the, they told us in church, uh, well, that's the reason it's plural is let us create man in our image is because it's written saying that that's the Lord God's in the form of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because they're saying that it's a plurality of the Godhead being three in one. So that was the argument, or that's what they've always told us. I shouldn't say argument. That was the indoctrination lie. And, and now let me show you something that's going to blow your mind. And let's start in John 10. And so I'll just, I'll, I'll paint a little picture of John 10 right now. So Jesus is standing around. There's a bunch of Jews and, the, and there's a bunch of Pharisees and uh, they're, they're, they're hating Jesus. And they don't, they want him dead. They don't want this guy around. He's interfering in their religion and they don't like it. And so he's standing around and he's talking about his sheep, that his sheep hear his voice and they follow me. He says, and I give to them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And then he said, my father, which gave them to me, is greater than all. Okay, so think about that, because Jesus is the Lord God. He is the father in the flesh. He's taken on the flesh. And he says, my father, which gave them to me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. And then he says, I and my father are one. And then in verse 31, now everybody pay attention, because my whole body is buzzing right now. Here it comes. This is the Holy Spirit. It says, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him because the Jews are pissed now. They want, they, they want to kill him. He just said, I and my father are one. And so they took up uh, stones to stone him. And Jesus answered and said to them, many good works have I shown you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? And he's saying, hey, guys, well, I've done all these good works. Why are you going to stone me? And then the Jews said, we stone thee not for good works, but for blasphemy, which is speaking evil. Uh, we, we stone thee for blasphemy because thou, 
being a man makest thyself God. Well, that's completely wrong. He is God that made himself a man. And what's really fascinating about this scripture is we have a bunch of gods that were made men also, which is us. That's who we really are. We're a bunch of gods that have been turned into men, and we're going to prove that right here, right now. So he said, they said, we're going to stone thee uh, for blasphemy because thou being a man makest thyself God. And then Jesus said to them, is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? And he just said, wait a minute, guys. <laughs> Don't your own scriptures say that y'all are gods? And then his next line was this. And if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, then say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest? Because I said, I am the son of God. And so what he just said is he said, wait a minute. Y'all are going to stone me for blasphemy because I being a man make as myself God. No, no, no. Your own scriptures say that all of you are gods and the scriptures cannot be broken. He just told everybody that right there. So that is not, that is impossible to argue with that scripture. So he, he was quoting uh, Psalm 82. So if we go to Psalm 82, uh, you'll see what uh, Jesus was referring to. And I just want to lay this groundwork because it's super important. I'll keep it short. So Psalm 82, here it is. This is what Jesus was referring to. He said, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. And here it is, verse 6. I have said you are God's. All of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and you shall fall like one of the princes. Okay, now I'm going to stop right there. I want everybody to look at the screen. Anyone that's looking at you now, um, you're looking at a picture called Locust Energy Folder, picture F3. You're looking at a giant serpent wearing a crown. That is the Vatican itself. Okay, so that, that very image that you're looking at, that is the Vatican, and it is the entire building is a serpent that is wearing a crown. So now, if you go inside the Vatican, the mouth of that very serpent on the inside of the building, I'm going to show it to you right now on your screen. This is called Locust Energy, picture F7. Now, you're looking at an image of a giant dead sheep and then the wool of the sheep are all God's angels being pulled into this vortex at that orange window. So they're all being pulled into this vortex and they're getting like pulled out of heaven. That's what that's a sculpture of. Uh, but no one could really discern that it was a dead sheep. That's what the Lord showed me. The whole altar is a giant dead sheep. What does Psalm 82 say? It says, I have said you are God's. The word is Elohim. The word Elohim means gods, angels, and magistrates. And then it says, you are all children of the Most High, but you shall die like men, and you shall fall like one of the princes. Well, if you look back at this, this picture that's on your screen right now, you'll see that the entire image is gods, angels, Elohim, magistrates, and they're being pulled into this vortex, and what it is is they're all falling. Now, I'm going to take the entire altar, and I'm going to take the altar, and I'm going to turn it upside down, because Isaiah said, those who try and hide their plans from the Lord, they turn everything upside down. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to take the entire altar, and I'm going to turn the entire altar upside down, and we're going to look at the altar, and then you'll understand Psalm 82. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to the comparison folder. And in the comparison folder, we're going to go down to picture E7 and picture E8. And you're going to be looking at straight up an image of the female reproductive system. I'm sorry, this is a little bit of adult content. 
It's all clinical. You are looking at a female reproductive system. There's the vagina, the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, the uterus and the cervix and the opening to the vagina. Well, when you turn that dead sheep upside down that's made out of Elohim, angels, gods, magistrates, and you turn it upside down, it becomes the female vagina and the female reproductive system. Wow, what does Psalm 82 say? I have said you are gods. All of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men, and you shall fall like one of the princes. So you're looking at an actual statue, uh, uh, an altar, the biggest altar in the world, in the Vatican, that's a giant dead sheep, and it's all God's children, angels, falling into the female reproductive system. Well, let me ask you a question. How in the world do you get a God to die like a man? You have to turn him into a man. So if you get turned into a man, how does that happen? Well, you have to come through the female reproductive system, don't you? Because we're all gods, but we're going to die like men, and we're going to fall like one of the princes. And so now you're looking at um, absolute proof. You're looking at a statue, and I'll, I'll take my camera, and I'll steady it, and I'll zero in on that image. You're looking at the female reproductive system that is the largest altar in the world, and, and it's also all God's angels that are falling and they're being birthed into the human uh, reproductive system. So there is Psalm 82 literally built into a statue at the Vatican, and it just so happens that that's, that altar right there is the mouth of the serpent. I want everybody just to stop and think about that for just a moment, and I'll show you that same serpent from another direction so you can understand that all God's angels have become food for the serpent. It's perfect. I mean, it's literally perfection in the delivery of information. So the Lord God told me, Jonathan, look at the Vatican from a 45 degree angle. Now, a lot of people, you know, I've heard people say, oh, God told you to do that. Absolutely. Just like it says in John 10, it said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Well, the Lord told me, I want you to look at the Vatican from a 45 degree angle from Google Earth. And I did what he said. Why do you think you're looking at a big serpent? Because I listened to the Lord. He told me what to do. And then he told me to look at the altar. And when I looked at the altar, the altar was a giant dead sheep. And I went, my God, it's a giant dead sheep. And then I went, oh my gosh, all the wool of the sheep is made up by God's angels. Wait a minute, what's going on? Well, didn't Jesus say? Do not your own scriptures say you are gods and you are all children of the most high, but you shall die like men. He was telling the exact truth. He, all he was doing was quoting Psalm 82. And it says everything right there in Psalm 82. Jesus just, he just reiterated it. He said, you're all gods. You're all children of the most high and the scriptures cannot be broken. And it says that exact same thing in Psalm 82. You're all gods. You're all children of the most high, but but you're going to die like men. Well, how do you have a God die like a man? You turn him into a man. That's all. Because everyone that's here is under judgment. None of us get off this planet alive. No one here gets out alive. If you get converted before you die, then you get to return home. But if you don't get converted before you die, you go into the pit and you're food for the serpent. And so here is a, a supernatural revelation gift proving the scriptures are true. And you're looking at it right now live, exactly, uh, exact delivery of the scriptures. It's perfect. Now, now the door is wide open. Now we can go to Genesis 1. Now we're going to take Genesis 1 and we are going to utterly destroy between Zen and myself. We are going to utterly destroy the lie. And the lie is, if everybody thinks that the word God in Genesis 1 is the Lord God, you are incorrect. Now, I want to make something very clear because a lot of people freak out. A lot of people are like, oh my God, uh, Lucifer and the fallen, uh, they did not create 
uh, the earth, they did not create this. And the answer is like, well, yeah, they did. But God, the Lord God still created it. Because if the Lord God created Lucifer and the fallen, and by the way, they were all guilty of insurrection and thievery. Um, that's why the cross at Calvary, they were all thieves and murderers. Um, if they were guilty of that, um, if God created them and they created anything, well, didn't the Lord God still create it? Of course he did. So now let's crack open. Uh, Let me I'll, add one thing here yeah, really yeah. quick, Johnny. Sure. sure. Uh, just want to add, to just to give you a little bit more to chew on with regard to what Johnny is saying and what we are about to go into and bring forth uh, confirmation of what he said. Because the the fallen ones, we know that they cannot create something from nothing. They have to counterfeit from what already is. And confirmation of this can be found in Genesis 2, where it says in Genesis 2, verse 4, uh, well, we're at break. We'll pick it up on the other side, and then we'll we'll get into it. Hold on, okay. everyone. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I want to bring up just a couple passages. First, to confirm that the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, the Trinity, they were responsible for creating everything that they pre-existed. They brought everything into being. And then once the there was the rebellion in heaven, the war in heaven, and Satan and the one-third of the angels of the Most High, which joined him in rebellion, they were cast out, and then they began to manipulate and to counterfeit and to genetically alter what was already here. But the creation was already found in existence, and they manipulated from what was. Confirmation of this can be found in where it says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, Elohim. If you go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, it says, these are the generations of the heaven and earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And so this is confirming for you that even though Elohim is attributed as created in the heaven and earth, that it was, of course, Yahweh Elohim, and that in that particular verse, the Genesis 1-1, before the rebellion, because the rebellion, in my opinion, happens after that, where the earth was destroyed, became without form and void. All of that was a result of the rebellion, the separation of light and darkness, the war in heaven. But that the Lord God and his angelic helpers, that they assisted in somewhat. But, of course, it's only the Trinity, Christ, the Father, and wisdom as the Holy Spirit which can bring forth out of nothingness and to create from nothing. And so, again, the angels can only manipulate from what already is. Now, with regard to our preexistence, just a couple of passages to confirm what Johnny is talking about with Psalms 82. And these are a couple of verses which people are very much aware of but have not ever attributed to our pre-existence and our election before being born into flesh and you know the, our spirits being basically blown in breathed into our flesh bodies and this is from second thessalonians where it says but we are bound to give thanks always to god for you brethren beloved of the lord because god hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth from the beginning this is before the foundations of the earth before the earth was created and in the scriptures it also says that uh, christ knew us before the foundations of the world confirmation of this can be also found in first ephesians it says according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, 
that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of the children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And so you see by these particular verses that the same thing that the word of the Lord, which is Christ, said unto Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. That this same thing applies to all of us. All of us have a special role and mission for being here in the flesh. It's just that not uh, everybody honors that. And so when you decide to and you choose to, then this same thing can apply to us. One last thing. This is from 2 Timothy. It says, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. And so there, all three of those verses affirm our preexistence and that we were known to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit before we ever entered into the wombs of our mothers. Johnny? Absolutely. And again, Colossians. Um, we're going to use Colossians here in just a minute. Um, so Colossians 1, I want you all to look at verse 16. It says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Pre pre um, so it's it's kind of a mind whapper for people to think well wait a minute how did lucifer and the fallen you know take place well one way to think about it is like this okay well i'm walking around talking i've, I've got a body and if i go build a building in the back of my house which i've done if i go behind my house and i build a building back there well did i build it or did the lord god build it well i built it but he gave me the ability to build it right but didn't he build it? Well, he had to have built it because he made me. So if I built a house, even though I did it, uh, well, he still built it. And so a lot of people have to understand, you got to be able to wrap your brain around that the Lord said, I create good and I create evil. He did create Lucifer, didn't he? He did. And so you have to understand that there's always this dynamic that's in play. And uh, when you're when you're able to you know, wrap your brain around the reality that God is all-encompassing, and he did create Lucifer, and Lucifer broke away from the whole part and wanted to do his own thing, and then God still owns and is is above and all in anything that Lucifer does. It's still the Lord God still in control of it, which is kind of a mind whapper for some people. But I want you guys to pay very close attention now because... I have two scriptures that will help your mind uh, just put this all together. And again, on your screen, I put up another picture. It's called Comparison D9, and it's a, it's a very tight close-up shot of that altar uh, from the Vatican. And you can very obviously see that that is a big dead sheep. Its tongue is sticking out. Uh, you can see its teeth and that all its wool is made up from uh, the God's angels that are being birthed into the reproductive system. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and enlarge that a little bit and try and slide it down on your screen. There you go. There it is. So you can see it. Okay, so now here we go. So let's go to Genesis 126 and let's start. Sometimes the best way to, to get a, a good understanding is to answer a question or two. So let me ask everybody this, and 
is the Lord God, the, the creator of all things, is he a vain show? I mean, if you had to describe the Lord God, the, cre the creator of everything, could you say, well, he's a vain show? Would that be an accurate representation of the Lord God? Well, what if I, what if you were to say, um, well, he's, he's, uh, his, his resemblance, a representative figure, especially an idol. Would you ever refer to the Lord God as a resemblance, hence a representative figure, especially an idol? Is the Lord God an illusion? Could you use, is the word illusion appropriate to say the Lord God is an illusion? So the answer for those has to be no. No. No and no. There's no way that the Lord God, uh, he hates idols. Anyone that's read the Bible, you know, just read the Bible. Uh, he hates idols. I'll just quote uh, Exodus 20 off the top of my head. It says, I am the Lord your God. I led you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall not make unto thyselves any graven image, any likeness of anything in the heavens, the earth, the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, and I will visit the iniquity of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those that hate me. So if you make an idol, you hate God. Idols are made by those that hate God. Uh, you go read any of, the, any of the prophets. Idolatry is the reason God destroys his people. He destroys them over and over for idolatry. So you cannot ever say that the Lord God uh, if you were talking about the image of God is a representative figure, especially an idol, there's no way. You can't ever say that the Lord God is a vain show, can you? That doesn't fit. Okay, so now let me ask you a couple more questions. Let me, let me switch to uh, another book of the Bible and ask you just a couple more questions about image. Okay, so... When we're talking about Jesus Christ, uh, you know, we're talking about everything was made by him and through him and for him, who is the image of the invisible God. If I, would, if I said that he is the image of the invisible God, if I'm talking about the word image for Jesus, uh, would the word likeness, he is the likeness of the invisible God. Is that an accurate way to talk about Jesus? Jesus is the likeness of the invisible God. Uh, that's accurate. Um, he is the representation of the invisible God. Is that accurate? Yes. He's the physical representation of the invisible God. So that fits. Uh, is he the resemblance of the invisible God? Well, he was the Lord God in the flesh and the way he conducted himself and the things that he did and his willingness to die for the good of others, that is the resemblance of the invisible God. So those all fit. Okay, so I'm going to show you now what I was talking about. We're going to go to Genesis 126, and we're going to read uh, that verse uh, in Genesis 126. It says, and God said, let us make man in our image, okay? Okay. The word God right there is the same exact word that is used in Psalm 82. When Jesus said, uh, don't your own scriptures say that you are Elohim? And the word is Elohim. So the word Elohim means gods, magistrates, plural, angels, plural. And it means of the supreme God. It does not mean the supreme God. It means of the supreme God. That's what the word Elohim means. It means of the supreme God. It means God's plural, magistrates plural, angels plural. And so in Genesis 126, it says, and Elohim said, God's angels, magistrates of the supreme God, let us 
make man in our image. The word image is vain show. So Elohim said, let us make man in our vain show. Let us make man in our uh, representative figure, especially an idol. And it says, let us make man in our phantom image. Let us make man in our illusion. Let us make man in our resemblance, hence a rep representative figure, especially in an idol and vain show. So we just answered that question. Is that the Lord God? That's impossible. Absolutely no way. So, you know, you just read Genesis 126 and God's Elohim, angels, magistrates, said, let us, which is plural, which is correct, because the word Elohim is plural. Let us make man, Adam, in our vain show. So now you know that that is not the Lord God. That is Lucifer and the fallen making a pre-Adamic man. And what that means is that's a walking, talking uh, human being uh, that does not have the soul like the Lord God breathed into him in Genesis 2. That's why it says Elohim. It doesn't say the Lord God. It says God. So now let's go to Genesis 2. Well, you know what? Oh, wait, before, wait. We go, yeah. wait, before you do that, I want to yeah. add to uh, and clarify a little bit more before we get to the second creation. And this is um, some teachings that not a lot of people understand. It, this, these things are found in both the Nakamati Codices and the Sumerian text. I'm going to share the other side of it just to give you from what the these fallen authorities describe themselves and uh, also what Christ reveals in the Nakamata Codices, which are some very advanced teachings. And this will help you to understand that the Genesis 1 creation, this pre-Adamic humanoid being, what, what it looked like and how it was genetically mon uh, modified. And so I'm just going to read a couple passages, then we'll go into Genesis 2. From the Nag Hammadi Codices, it says this. Now these things were revealed by the will of Christ to the souls who will come to the fashion bodies of the authorities. The authorities meaning the Elohim, the fallen, the rebel angels being cast out. Concerning these, the holy voice said, multiply and flourish to rule over all the creatures. And these are the ones who are taken captive by the chief creator according to their destinies, and thus they were locked in the prisons of their fashioned bodies until the consummation of the age. And so these things that we're talking about, the difference between Elohim being in their creating and also with Genesis, with Yahweh Elohim and his creating, is affirmed in great detail in the Nakamani Codices. Now I'm going to share what kind of being from the actual Sumerian text where they talk about the difference between what is referenced as a primitive worker, which is again the Genesis 1 creature, and the civilized man, which is what we will talk about in Genesis 2. And this is what they describe in the Sumerian text with this particular pre-Adamic human being. It says this, a solution is possible, Enki was saying, let us create a Lulu, a primitive worker, the hardship work to take over. Let the being the toil of the Anunnaki carry on his back. Astounded were the besieged leaders, speechless indeed they were. Who ever heard of a being a fresh created? a worker who the Anunnaki's work can do. They summoned Nimma, one who of healing and succor was much knowing. Enki's words to her, they repeated. Whoever of such a thing heard, they heard asked. The task is unheard of. She to Enki said, all beings from a seed have descended. One being from another over eons did develop. None from nothing ever came. 
How right you are, my sister Anki said, smiling. A secret of the Abzu let me to you all reveal. The being that we need, it already exists. All the, we have to do is put on it the mark of our essence. Thereby, a Lulu, a primitive worker, shall be created. So did Enki to them say, Let us hereby a decision make a blessing to my plan give, to create a primitive worker by the mark of our essence, to fashion him. So was Enki to the leaders saying, The being that we need, it already exists. See, this is confirming that they didn't create the being. It was already created by Yahweh Elohim and present on the earth, but that they manipulated it. Continuing. With astonishment did the other leaders Enki words here. By the words, they were fascinated. Creatures in the Abzu there are, Enki was saying, that walk. This is the description of this particular being. They walk erect on two legs. Their forelegs they use as arms. With hands they are provided. Among the animals of the steppe they live. They know not dressing in garments. They eat plants with their mouths. They drink water from the lank and the ditch. Shaggy with hair is their whole body. Their head hair is like a lion's. With gazelles they jostle. With teeming creatures in the waters they delight. In my opinion, they're basically describing a Bigfoot type of being, which is one of the pre-Adamite beings that they worked with in the manipulation. Continuing just a little more. The leaders to Anki words with amazement listen. No creature like has like that has ever in the Eden been seen. Enlil, disbelieving, said eons ago on Nibiru, our predecessors, like that might have been. Ninma was saying, it is a being, not a creature, Ninma was saying. To behold it must be a thrill. To the house of life, Enki led them. In strong cages, there were some of the beings. At the sight of Enki and the others, they jumped up with fists on the cage bars. They were beating. They were grunting and snorting. No words were they speaking. Male and female, they are. Enki was saying, malehood and females they have, like us from Nibiru coming, they are procreating. Just a little more. Ningishida, my son, their fashioning essence has tested, akin to ours it is. Like two serpents it is entwined. When therewith our life essence shall be combined, our mark upon them shall be. A primitive worker shall be created. Our commands will be understood. Our tools he will handle. The toil in the excavations he shall perform. To the Anunnaki in the Abzu relief shall come. So was Enki with enthusiasm saying, with excitement his words came forth. Enlil at the words was hesitant. The matter is one of great importance. On our planet, slavery has long ago been abolished. Tools are the slaves, not other beings. A new creature beforehand non-existing you wish to bring into being? Creation in the hands of the father of all beginning alone is held. See, even they, the Anunnaki, recognized the creator of us all, Yahweh Elohim. So was Enlil in opposing saying, stern were his words. Enki to his brother responded, not slaves, but helpers is my plan. The being already exists, Ninma was saying, to give more ability is the plan. Not a new creature, but one existing more in our image made. Enki, with persuasion, said, with little change, it can be achieved. Only a drop of our essence is needed. Last paragraph. A grave matter it is. It is not to my liking, Enlil was saying. Against the rules from planet to planet journey it is. By the rules of the earth coming, it was forbidden. To attain gold was our purpose. To replace the father of all beginning, it was not. I'll just stop there, but uh, it just shows you that this particular creature, this particular being, was a Bigfoot-type pre-Adamic humanoid, and that it already existed, it was created by the father of all, and that these fallen ones only manipulated it 
and created um created it in their image as Johnny was bringing forth and that they created this humanoid type, this primitive worker, but it was no way anything like a modern human that can speak, that has dialogue, that has language, that has intelligence, even greater than the fallen ones, uh, as we will uh, discuss in going forward, Johnny. All right, so yeah, so, I want to I want to focus very much on this one word image. Okay, this is so important right now. Look, so when you read verse twenty six in Genesis one, this is so important that you understand that this word image is not no matter what the Lord God. It says, and God said, the word is not the Lord God. It says the Lord. It says God said. It doesn't say the Lord God said, it says God, and that is Elohim. Let us make man in our image. Now, the word image, again, I'm going to read to you the definition of the word image. It is Selem in Hebrew, Selem. And the word Selem means a phantom image. It means an illusion. It means a resemblance, hence a representative figure especially an idol it means image and vain show so this representation of man is not is not the lord god let me show you something in let's go to uh second corinthians 2 because i'm going to use second corinthians 2 to prove to you now that 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 production in Genesis 1:26 that was an idol because it says uh, Elohim said, "Let us make man in the form of an idol." That's what it says. Let us make man in a vain show in an idol. That's what it says. Well, Hold if you read, Johnny. I'm sorry. We're at break. We're at okay. break. We'll pick it up on the other side, everyone. Okay. All right, welcome back, everybody, for a second hour. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio. And as uh, I have my special guest, my good brother, uh, Jonathan Kleck of BeforeTheFire.com, here joining us to discuss the two creations, that of Genesis 1, 26-28, and the other of Genesis 2, verse 7. Johnny? Right. So here we go now. Let's just very quick recap on Genesis 1, 26. It says, and, and God said, the word is Elohim. The word Elohim means of the supreme God. It, mean God. it means God's magistrates, angels, all plural. Said, let us make man in our, in the, and I'm going to use the word image. The word image means quote vain show it means resemblance hence a representative figure especially an idol that's what it says so the the word for image in genesis 126 uh if i read that sentence using the definition of the word image i could read it exactly like this and angels said let us make men in our representative figure especially an idol that's what it says let us make man in our image representative figure especially an idol vain show okay now let's go to colossian or let's go to second corinthians uh chapter 6 verse 16 um it, it it's talking about you know don't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? So they're saying, you know, he's saying, hey, you know, why you can't be yoked together. By the way, a yoke uh, is a piece of wood that would go over the neck of two oxen, and uh, as well as two slaves. Slaves used to be yoked together because it made it harder for them to escape. So they would each have a collar on 
with a stick going between the two collars and it made it very difficult for them to do anything. They couldn't escape because they were yoked together. Well, let me show you something here in verse 16. It says, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? And the reason it says that is because in Genesis 1.26, it says, and Elohim, which is this false creation, uh, Elohim said, let us make man in our vain show, especially an idol. And so it says right here in uh, 2 Corinthians 2.16, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So here's the thing. How, how does anyone walk with God? How, do, how did anyone, uh, you know, if, if you're born again, how did, you, how did you come to walk with the Lord God? Well, you had to be born again. There's no other way that you can walk with God. So what does God do? He usurps, he usurps the temple. There's no other way around it. The Lord God usurps the temple, which is run by an idol before you get saved. There's no way around it. I'll say it again. If you're walking and talking on this earth and you haven't been saved, the prince of the power of the air is your master. The Bible said you were caught in a snare of the devil to do his will as he chooses. That's what the Bible says. You were caught in the snare. By the way, the snare, a snare is a trap that turns you upside down. So if you're walking around and you're talking on this planet, you are the walking dead. The Bible says, arise, O sleeper. Wake up from the dead and Christ will give you light because you're a walking idol. You are a walking, talking, dead idol because the Lord God has to usurp the temple. He, you, you have to be born again and then the spirit of the living God comes into the temple and you are born again and you are a new creation. That's why I just proved right now using those two scriptures, Genesis 126 and Elohim angels said, let us make men in our vain show, especially an idol. Because everybody that's born is an idol. You're a walking, talking idol until you're born again. That's why it says right here, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. Well, I'll tell you what. No one becomes the temple of the living God until they're born again. You can't until a new spirit comes to you. And you, I'll, I'll use the scriptures. I will give you a new spirit and a new heart. I'll give you a heart of, of flesh. I will give you a new spirit. Unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. So right here in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 2, 16, it says, For you are the temple of the living God, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Because the idol you has to go. There's, there's a good you and there's a bad you inside every human being. There's a double. There You have your own evil twin. There's a good you and there's a bad you. There's a double you. And uh, that's where we're going to go with the next set of imagery. I want to show everybody the, the paradigm that the Lord showed me. And this is just mission critical that um, I'd like everybody to look at. You now that's watching, I'm going to show you an image of the Virgin. This is an image of the Virgin to Guadalupe. And I'll enlarge it a little bit. There you go. And over on the right, oh, by the way, let me tell you the image number. It's the comparison folder, and it's picture B4. Comparison folder, picture B4. And over on the right, right here, you'll see an image of the Virgin. But when you turn the Virgin upside down, it becomes a sheep with its tongue sticking out. 
Those are the eyes, nose, tongue sticking out. So why does an image of the virgin become a sheep with its tongue sticking out? How was I able to discern? How was I able to tell anyone that the virgin, when you turn it upside down, becomes a sheep with its tongue sticking out? Well, when I was born into the flesh, I came into this world upside down. Uh, it says in the Targum, Jonathan, and the Lord God made unto uh, Adam and his wife Hava vestures of honor from the skin of the serpent, uh, which he had cast from them, and upon the, you know, their bodies he he clothed them, and he, they cast away the the bodies that they had previously had. The it, he calls it the adornment that they had previously had. So they lost their bodies that were glorified. And they became trapped in serpent flesh as a result of the fall. That's what it says in the Targum. As a matter of fact, if you if you just look at Genesis in the Bible and you break down the words, you can see the same thing. It says he made them uh, uh, skins to clothe them. Uh, it was the skin of the serpent because the serpent fornicated with Eve. And when the serpent beguiled Eve, it means seduced into having sex. And it says, the serpent told Eve, uh, I'm sorry, Eve told the serpent, the Lord God said, we may eat of any of the trees of the garden except for the fruit in the midst of the garden. He said, neither shall you eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. The word touch means to lay with a woman. That's one of the definitions of the word touch in Genesis 3. So we have a fall from grace and we have this fall, but it, it's centered around the virgin. It's centered around Eve. That's why Lucifer and his entire race worship the virgin. That's why the Catholic church is in the shape of a giant serpent wearing a crown because that represents Lucifer, the serpent, the dragon, Satan, uh, wearing the crown in this world. And he actually thinks he's 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 going to win, that he's beating God. And that's why the mouth of the serpent is the female reproductive system, because that's where all Satan's food comes from, is because every every host body that's born uh, via the female reproductive system, unless you're born again, you become food for the serpent. So again, there's another perfect physical representation of the reality that the Bible is the perfect, without error, word of God. It is, it is absolutely perfect and without error. So again, 2 Corinthians uh, 6, 16, it says, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Because until you're born again, you are an idol. But then the Lord God, again, usurps the temple, he takes over the temple for those that submit. And when I say he usurps, you have to submit. And by the way, you are already predestined in Christ to submit. That's why I said, I knew you before the foundations of the world. And I predestined you in Christ to be conformed to the image of his son. And so for those of us that have been called, you know, a lot of people find that a very hard pill to swallow. But I didn't write the Bible. Um, the Lord God did. And it says, um, you were predestined in Christ before the foundation of the world. So once you are born again, then the Lord God takes over the temple. And it says, and what agreement have the temple of God with idols? Because the one that's the inside of the temple, that's the bad you, the, the evil you, that one's got to go. That gets reconciled to God. Uh, Ephesians 2, his purpose was to make one new man from the two because inside every host body is a good you and a bad you every single host body has the same problem and we are at odds with ourselves. like picture a right side up you and an upside down you all in the same body and in order to be reconciled to god you have to be born again and when you're born the first time you're born upside down you come into this world upside down via your mother's birthing you know and then once you're born, when I was born again, I started turning everything upside down and I was able to show people uh, the truth. 
And the Bible says, unless you're born again, you cannot see, see the kingdom of heaven. Well, once I got born again, I was able to see it. And that's why I'm able to show it to you. Uh, I'd like to put one more picture on your screen uh, before we continue with the scriptures. Um, by the way, Alyssa Howard is putting in the chat room um, the scriptures. So if anybody needs to read them, uh, Ephesians 2.15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, uh, which was established in Genesis 3, the Lord said, I will put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of woman, between your seed and her seed. And so Jesus Christ is the one that slays that enmity. He's the one that reconciles the enmity uh, between the two and the one host body. And it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of the two one new man, thus making peace. So the whole thing is, Jesus is making peace with inside your temple by, by converting you and making peace between the good you and the bad you. So you're no longer at odds with yourself. Uh, it's actually just the most amazing thing once you, once you really get to see it. On your screen is another image. Um, I really particularly like this a lot because uh, it's the same exact venue. It's a woman right here, uh, yellow. And when you turn it upside down, the woman becomes a dead sheep, which is identical to the Virgin de Guadalupe. When you turn the Virgin upside down, she becomes a dead sheep. When you turn this other image of a woman upside down, she becomes a dead sheep. And I like that because that's from a hieroglyph from ancient Egypt. And I'll move the sheep right into your view. By the way, let me tell you the picture number that's comparison fo uh, folder, picture number B5 and picture number B6. And if you look at picture B6, it's very easy to see that that image of a dead sheep right there with the blue teardrop coming out of its eye, that is a hieroglyph that is 1,300 uh, years before Christ ever walked the earth. So you have an identical agenda. Yeah, which is impossible. I, there's no way that I could turn over an image of the Virgin and show you a, a sheep with its tongue sticking out and then go to a hieroglyph that's 1,300 years before Christ and turn it upside down and show you the identical agenda. Well, how did I do that? I turned it upside down. I, let, me, let me quote uh, Isaiah now. Okay, uh, let's go to Isaiah. Because uh, And then we're going to go to uh, Genesis 2 because I want to show you all just the most amazing connection between the, the creation of Adam and Genesis, I'm in Genesis 2 and Isaiah verse 20, chapter 29, verse 15 and 16. Okay, so I'll tell you what, let's do Genesis 2 first. Watch this. So it says in verse four, these are the generations of the heaven and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So who made the heavens and the earth? A lot of people, uh, well, it says the Lord God. What about Genesis one? Well, it says Elohim. So, you know, or... You can get into this, uh, you know, back and forth debate. Well, was that Lucifer and the fallen taking part in the creation process? I believe absolutely it was. Just like if I went and built a house behind my house right now, even if I built it, let's say there was a restriction and I was not supposed to build anything and building anything would get me uh, uh, an enormous uh, fine. Well, if I went and build it, built it, if I built it, even if I built it, it, the Lord still built it because he created me. So anyway, so here we go in verse four. These are the generations of the heaven and the earth when, the, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Okay, let's go down to verse seven. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. 
and man became a living soul. Let's look at the words here. Okay, here we go. Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God. Now, how come it doesn't say just God? Well, this is the head of all the gods. This is the one that is the head honcho chief of all the Elohim. He is the self-existent eternal Elohim. That's the difference. He's not Elohim. He's the Lord Elohim. He is the eternal self-existent Jehovah Elohim. And it says, and the Lord God formed man, which is Adam. It says, the word for formed is a very interesting word. The word is Yatzar. This is very important, guys. This is a totally different uh, formation from Genesis 126. This says, the Lord God formed man. In Genesis 126, it said, Elohim said, let us make man in our image. It's a different word. And the Lord God formed man from the dust. The word formed means through squeezing into shape, listen very carefully, especially as a potter. So the Lord God formed, squeezed into shape as a potter, Adam, from the dust, and the word dust is clay. Okay, so mark those words. The Lord God formed as a potter. So the Lord God squeezed into shape as a potter, man from the clay of the ground. Okay, now I just showed you guys some images of dead sheep. And the only way to show you the images of the dead sheep was to turn the other image of the virgin upside down. And when I turned it upside down, I was able to show you it's a dead sheep. Why is it a dead sheep? Okay, let's go to Isaiah 29. Okay, everybody go to Isaiah 29. And here you go. This is the way the Lord God unlocked everything for me. Okay, here we go. Isaiah 29. Uh, verse 14, because in verse 14, he talks about what he's going to do. He says, therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. And the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Woe unto them that go to deep, that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. And their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us? Who knoweth us? Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. Wow. Time out. Time out. This is huge. Do you all understand it? There's a verse in verse 15 where someone is talking about uh, yeah, the Lord is talking about there's a group that are hiding themselves, their identity is hidden, and they're saying, who seeth us, who knoweth us, so they're saying they can't be seen, and they're saying they can't be known, and then it says, surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as, regarded as, the potter's clay. Wow. Back to Genesis 2. And the Lord God formed Adam as a potter from the clay. It is not the same as Genesis 126. Let, uh, and Elohim said, let us make man in our vain show. So if you want to be the real deal, if you're the real deal and you're what the Lord God actually formed and you belong to the Lord God, it says it right there. It says it. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be regarded as the potter's clay. For shall the work say, which is us, for the, shall the work say of him that made it? He made me not, or shall the thing that is framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? And so, if the Lord God is using his prophet Isaiah 
to show you if you want to know what's what. And you want to be able to see that which is hidden in the darkness, those that are concealing their identity, and you want to be the real deal that belongs to the Lord God. Turn things upside down, and you'll see it. And that is the way that I was able to show you all of this information, including the largest altar in the world, and I'll show it to you again, the largest altar in the world that's on your screen right now, is also an image of a dead sheep. So what's with all the dead sheep? Because we're the food for the serpent. That's what we are. That's why that, that, that altar right there is the mouth of the serpent. Just like it said. Uh, you're, beware of your enemy. He prowls around like a, a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour and so now the mystery has unfolded and now the entire image of the largest altar in the world is a dead sheep but when you turn it upside down it is the female reproductive system and what's going into the female reproductive system are all god's children and that's psalm 82 you are gods but you shall die like men and you shall fall like one of the princes so the catholic church built an altar of psalm 82 right there there's all god's children falling they're being birthed into the flesh have i not said you're god's angels but you shall die like men that's why they're being birthed into the female reproductive system and they become so then we get caught in a host body system and once we're caught in a host body system then we can be transmuted and turned into food for Satan because we have our own evil doppelganger because now we are the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So in every host body is good and evil. And that's what the Bible said. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. And so in every host body, there's a good you and there's a bad you and they are contending with each other. You are at odds with yourself and you have committed sins against God. And so now you have been separated from your God. And so the only way to get back is to confess and admit that you're the one that did everything you did. Uh, no one made you do it. Well, the devil made you do it, but that's the devil in you. And that's the big, uh, that's kind of the big brain whapper is that you are your own worst enemy because there's a good you and there's a bad you. And the bad you is destroying the good you. You're being self cannibalized. And that's a, that's a whole nother just mind destroying topic because the Ouroboros, which is a very uh, common symbol throughout history, um, the, is a symbol of what's called autosarcophagy which is self-cannibalization, which is what we all got caught into. We all got in, caught into a system of self-cannibalization. And that's why Jesus came, he, to reconcile the difference between both halves, to create one new man from the two. And there it is. Now all I'm right, brother. Yeah. Hold on. We'll be right back for the final segment, everyone. All right, welcome back, everybody, for final segment. Uh, just a really quick passage and then one other comment, then I'm going to turn it back over to Johnny. This is also from the Nakamati Codices. It says, the first ruler formulated a plan with his powers. He sent his angels to the human daughters so that they might take some of them and raise offspring for their pleasure. At first, they were unsuccessful. When they had proved unsuccessful, they met again and devised another plan. They created a contemptible spirit, similar to the spirit that had descended, in order to adulterate souls through this spirit. The angels changed their appearance to look like their partners of these women and filled the women with the spirit of darkness that they had concocted and with evil. They brought gold, silver, gifts, copper, iron, metal, and all sorts of things. They brought great anxieties to the people who followed them, leading them astray with many deceptions. These people grew old without experiencing pleasure and died without finding truth or knowing the God of truth. In this way, all creation was forever enslaved from the beginning of the world until its present day. 
All right, one final thing with regard to the Genesis 2, the Yahweh Elohim created Adam, that when this Adam fell and became present upon the earth, the as I read previously about the Anunnaki and they're creating the primitive worker, this Lulu, that when the modern humanity, the last 6,000 years, when our ancestors appeared upon the earth, they were dumbfounded. It was a wonder to them, and it shocked them so mightily that they wrote this. It says this, A wonder of wonders it is in the wilderness by themselves to have come about. Indeed, a wonder of wonders it is. A new breed of earthling on earth has emerged. A civilized man has the earth itself brought forth, farming and shepherding, crafts and tool making, he can be taught. So was Enlil to Enki saying, let us of the new breed to Anu word send. Of the new breed word to Anu on Nibiru was beam. Let seeds that can be sown, let ewes that sheep become to earth be sent. So did Enki and Enlil to Anu the suggestion make. By civilized man, let Anunnaki and earthlings become satiated. Anu the words heard. By the words he was amazed that by life essences one kind to another lead is not unheard of. To them words back he sent that on earth a civilized man from the Adamu so quickly appeared. That is unheard of. The Lost Book of Enki. And so you can see that the Anunnaki were dumbfounded at the sudden appearance of the civilized man or what Yahweh Elohim created as modern humanity, Adam and Eve. Jonathan. All right. So I want to I want to show everybody just some physical evidence, like court admissible evidence. Um, and uh, if hopefully everybody's got. Uh, the you now um, link uh, going. If not, hopefully you have at least the twin folders. Um, uh, Alyssa, maybe you can put the twin folders, uh, the twin folder and the twin one and serpent one. So we're going to use twin folder one and serpent folder one right now. So let's have a look. And before before we start, I want to give everybody a visual representation of the word twin. I want everybody to look. If you write a capital T and then a capital W, capital I, capital N, you can make the letter W by making two intersecting V's. Uh, when you make uh, when you make the letter W using two intersecting V's, like on your screen right now, you'll see it makes an X in the middle. Okay, this has turned out to be one of the most amazing reveals I've ever seen because it is so prolific in so many places and it it really uh it really just well it'll hit home here in just a minute once I start using uh this revelation of information again this is the gift of knowledge at work the gift the gift of wisdom um, that you're going to get to see here in action. I want you to see, I want you to look very closely at the letter W. The letter W is made by two intersecting V's, and it's the word twin. And it, they use those two intersecting V's because those V's together look like twins. And so they thought, hey, you know what? We'll make the letter W with two intersecting V's, and we'll write the word twin. It'll be a great logo. I want you to take a look at that. Okay, now watch this. Now, again, you know, I told y'all uh, in the beginning, this there's obviously this fornication that took place in the garden, and uh, I'm gonna read. Um, I'm gonna read to you from the Targum. I could also show you the same thing in the Bible. Uh, it would take a little longer to walk you through all the the vocabulary, but it's the same exact thing. You can get the exact same thing out of the Bible, but I'm gonna read this from the Targum. It says, and Adam knew Hava, Eve, his wife, who had desired the angel, and she conceived, and she bare Cain. And she said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord. And she added to bear from her husband, Adam, his twin, 
even Abel. Abel. So right there, it says that, you know, Adam knew Eve, his wife, who had desired the angel, which is the serpent in the garden, and she bare Cain, and she said, look, I've acquired a man, the angel of the Lord, and she added to bear from her husband, Adam, his twin. That's called heteropaternal superfecundation twins. It's when a woman has two uh, children at the same birthing event, and they're twins, but they have different fathers. Um, I have uh, I have images of, you know, a woman that had one one black kid and one white kid, and she had different fathers. It's just, it's an amazing thing, and it's real. So anyway, that's what it says right there in the Targum. That's also what it says in the Bible. Well, what are the names of the two kids? The names of the kids are Cain and Abel. Okay, if you put the word Cain and Abel together, and you say it quickly, it's cannibal. Like cannibal, and that's not by accident, because... The whole system that we live in is cannibalistic. There's a good you and there's a bad you. You have your own twin. There's a, there's a bad you that's destroying the good you. And because of that, you are in what's called a transmutation circle. I mean, you are being transmuted into something else. Okay, I want to show you on your screen. We're looking at the twins folder, and we're looking at picture J1. This is really amazing. It's a head of a serpent. It's a, it's a head of a big green serpent. And next to it, uh, let's see, I'm going I'm to switch uh, folders. I'm going to go to serpent one as well. I'm going to enlarge the image of the serpent. So you can see that big green snake head. I want to show you something absolutely amazing. Okay, now I'm going to go back to the twin folder. Okay. Y'all ever hear the double-headed phoenix? The double-headed phoenix is everywhere. It's on the Russian flag. It's a Donald Trump coat of arms. He has the double-headed phoenix. Uh, the coat of arms for Russia is the double-headed phoenix. The symbol of the Illuminati is the double-headed phoenix. The Freemasons are the double-headed phoenix. The double-headed phoenix, I have an image of it on your screen. It has a phoenix that's rising, and it's got two heads. Uh, it's a bird that's got two heads, and they are opposing directions. And let me tell you what it really represents. It represents your condition. It represents what's inside of you, and it represents who you are. We are all the double-headed phoenix, and I'll prove it in just a second. This is taken from the Catholic Church. Again, this is an altar at the Catholic Church. And if you look at the top of the double-headed phoenix right here, yeah, by the way, this is, let me tell you what image this is. This is Twins J3. It's the Twins folder, image J3. And on top of the double-headed phoenix, you'll see a crown, but it's the head of a serpent. And the head of the serpent is connecting two interlocking Vs, making the letter W, identical to the, the word twins I just showed you that had the two interlocking Vs making a W. Now you're looking at the same W, but it's two interlocking DNAs, and the crown that's on top of the two Vs in the middle of the W is the head of a serpent because the serpent rules the twin system. Now let me show you. I'm going to take the image of that serpent, and I'm going to drag it into that folder live, and there it is, and I'm going to put it right on there, right in front of you. So here's the head of the serpent, and I'll put it right there on that silver crown. And so there is the twin system, the double-headed phoenix, uh, which is the representation of the Illuminati. It's a representation of the Freemasons. When you look at the 33-degree uh, Masons with the double-headed phoenix, it's a Russian flag. It's Donald Trump's coat of arms. This is very common, and it represents the system that we're all in. Because in the Garden of Eden, the first two kids that were born were Cain and Abel. And the older one, Cain killed Abel. And it represents the system that we're in because inside of you is your own Cain killing your own Abel, whatever your name is. It doesn't matter. The system inside of you is cannibal, cannibalistic. And that's what's going on in every host body. And the only way to stop it 
is to be reconciled to God through Christ because he stops the enmity and the cannibalization going on inside of you because he restores both to God through the cross, making one new man from the two. Okay, now I want you to go back and we're going to look at this uh, twin system again. And I'm going to show you all kinds of stuff you probably would never have noticed. And it's just going to blow your mind. Okay, we're looking at the twins folder. We're looking at uh, these two big V's. I'm going to take one V and I'm going to interlock it with the V next to it. And I'm going to make a W, see? So the two V's interlock make a W. Well, here's, here's two V's that are interlocked making a W right there. And I took that from this label off a bottle of wine that's called the TPW. The Prisoner Wine Company. Look at the letter W. It's two interlocking Vs. The Prisoner Wine Company. And then when you look at a bottle of their wine, it's called Blindfold. And there's a slave, and he's blindfolded, and his arms are behind his back, and he's like tied to a tree, and there's a serpent eating him. Here's another... A uh, set of interlocking V's making a W. That's EWTN. That's a twins folder picture K7. And it has an image of the world. It's EWTN. The W again is made by interlocking V's. That's the global Catholic network. And that's the reason it has interlocking W's making, uh, interlocking V's making a W. Now, here's one that's going to blow your mind. Does everybody know who Marina Abramovic is? Anyone who knows who John Podesta is and that John Podesta, the pedophile, uh, you know, that was accused of the Pizzagate scandal and accused of pedophilia and child murder, well, he attends parties with Marina Abramovic. Marina Abramovic is a witch, and she has, quote, spirit cooking parties, and she invites her friends and uh, Hillary Clinton, John Podesta, and they go and they actually have a coffin that's filled with blood, and they take little scoops of blood with these little spoons, like you do at the grocery store with a sample spoon, and their guests go uh, through the party, and they take little scoops of blood that are in a coffin, and they have what's called a spirit cooking party because they know that inside of you one spirit is cannibalizing the essence of one of God's angels. Look how she starts her spirit. Her look at her incantation. It says with a sharp knife cut deeply into the middle finger of of your hand and and eat the pain. Look at the letter W, the way she starts every incantation. The letter W, again, is interlocking Vs. Well, if you take your hand and you put it in front of your face and you put your middle finger straight up and then you separate your pinky and the finger next to it and you separate your thumb and your index finger, it makes a W, doesn't it? And you're supposed to cut that finger and suck the pain and drink the blood out of your own finger because it makes a W, two interlocking Vs again. This is one of the greatest uh, reveals I've, I, I, could, I couldn't even believe it when the Lord showed it to me. The reason it's very common is because the V and the V, if you look at it in a, both uh, in Roman numerals, is the number five, like the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins. Let me show you another place where you see interlocking Vs making a W. Here is... Here's two interlocking Vs. One has a star and one has a crescent moon. And that is the, the logo for the city of Waco, Texas. So if you drive into Waco, Texas, you'll see a big, uh, big metal sign that has Welcome to Waco. And it has the letter W that's made by two interlocking Vs, one with the star and one with the crescent moon. Everybody pay attention now. When you turn those upside down, so just like Isaiah said, those who try and hide their plans, they turn everything upside down. So when you turn the, the logo for the city of Waco upside down, my God, look what it turns into. 9-11. Because they had a king over them, the angel 
of the bottomless pit. So the city of Waco, right in front of your face, worships the angel of the bottomless pit. And they have the symbol for Islam, the symbol for witchcraft, and the letter W for the city of Waco is made by two interlocking Vs. Um, it, this has been a consistent pattern. Uh, it is repetitive. And you'll see it over and over again. The, the VW, Volkswagen, made by Hitler. I don't know if people know this. Hitler was obsessed with twins. Uh, he did experiments on twins. Um, he wanted to start the master race. He also was behind the VW, the, the car. Uh, it was uh, Hitler's program, the Volkswagen, it means people's car, and he wanted to make a car that was affordable for all his people, and the Volkswagen is a symbol of that, and if you look at the Volkswagen again, it is two interlocking Vs with an X in the middle representing the X chromosome. So again, uh, the reveal uh, of the twin system has turned out to be, for the ministry that I'm doing, uh, the end all and be all of understanding what uh, what the entire thing that was revealed to me. There's an upside down you and there's a right side up you. Uh, there is a double you, get it? So if you're looking at, again, if you're looking at these uh, twin Vs, I'll take one V and I'll interlock it with the V next to it. There is a good you and there is a bad you. There is a double you. And that's why the double-headed phoenix represents the twin DNA system and the twin towers. That's why the twin towers were bombed, because the twin towers represented the system that we are all born into. We are all born into a host body that is a cannibalistic, cannibal, cannibalistic system, and we are all caught in a host body, and it was a trap by Satan in order to cannibalize God's children. And that's where the Ouroboros comes from. And that's where all these ancient symbols come from. Uh, I'd like to show you if we have time, uh, a uh, scene from the Grammy Awards. Uh, Beyonce was at the Grammy Awards and she was wearing a dress and the dress tells the entire story. It's one of the most amazing uh Amazing reveals. I could not believe what I was seeing when I saw it, but let's see if I can get that picture up on your screen real quick. Uh, by the way, if you're going to look at this image on your own, it's in the special projects folder, and under that is Welcome to the World of Good and Evil. And when you open up that folder, you will see a twin, a serpent twins folder. And when you open up that folder, you'll see one that says Ouroboros. And the Ouroboros is the story of the whole thing. It's self-cannibalization. It's called autosarcophagy. Oddly enough, uh, pharaohs were all buried in what's called a sarcophagus. And uh, the information that the Lord's let me see uh, shows that in ancient Egypt, it shows uh, aliens commingling with humans and uh, those pharaohs were buried in what's called a sarcophagus, and a sarcophagus means flesh eating. Okay, here we go. There's Beyonce from the Grammy Awards. Uh, we're looking at Ouroboros folder picture B1. This is one of the most amazing, amazing things I've ever been shown by the Lord. This is the gift of knowledge. So what you're looking at right here is you can see this is a, a serpent. And it's wrapped around the head of a woman with her eyes closed. And it's in the middle of a three-pointed star. Well, I very clearly, when I was looking at this, I heard the Lord tell me, look up the meaning of a three-pointed star. So I looked it up, and I, I typed it into Google. And a three-pointed star is called an isotoxal star. And an isotoxal star, star is an absolutely mind-boggling to understand what it represents. Let me see, let me read to you what it is. An isotoxal figure is edge transitive. Informally, this means there is only one type of edge to the object given two edges. There is a translation. 
a rotation and or reflection that will move one edge to the other. I'll say it again. Okay, listen. Isotoxyl is edge transitive. That means there is one type of edge given to the object. Given two edges, there is a translation, rotation, and or reflection that will move one edge to the other while leaving the region occupied by the object unchanged. What does that mean? Well, when you look at it on that she's got an Ouroboros on her stomach and she's carrying twins in the middle of her belly with the Ouroboros wrapped around it, basically it means that one is becoming the other. That's just a simple way of saying it. The one on top is becoming the one on bottom and the one on the bottom is becoming the one on top. And that is what's happening in the entire system. The entire system is self-cannibalizing. Uh, even the Ouroboros figure goes back, you know, before ancient Egypt, and it is a representation of self-cannibalization. And that's why Beyonce at the Grammy Awards was wearing a dress that had a that had the Ouroboros inside of an isotoxal star while she's carrying twins. And that is literally the mystery of all things in front of everybody's face without, I don't even think uh, Beyonce uh, knows uh, the gravity of what uh, she was wearing or the understanding of how profound her dress on her was uh, in in regards to the fact that she's carrying twins as well. And so she's she's literally a walking, talking paradigm of the entire system because the system itself is cannibalistic. That's why the first two children were Cain and Abel, cannibal. That's why the twin towers were bombed because the two have become one, isotoxal. One has become the other. And that's uh, just the best way I know how to explain it. That's why the hey, Twin Tony. Towers were turned into the One World Freedom Tower. Two yeah. minutes, brother. I want to give you a chance to give out all your website contacts. Uh, you know what? They, uh, I'll tell you what. On the website stuff, I'll let Alyssa write it in your chat room. Um, right. I would really suggest, though, uh, Clay and I are wrapping up like a four-hour DVD right now. And all this information is in the DVD we're doing right now. And we're getting ready to post it. The DVD will be posted online on on my YouTube channel, The Jonathan Kleck. Uh, and it'll be posted in about a week. We got to do some more editing. And I got to wrap it up with the conclusion. But it's going to be absolutely mind-destroying. Because all this information's in it. All of it. Every bit of it. Uh, so that's, brother. Thank you, Zen. Hey, man. We appreciate you. Uh, I just want, I hope that all that we brought forth this evening helps you to understand Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 in greater light so that you can also make more sense of these other things as far as the ancient mythologies and the ancient mysteries as revealed in the Nag Hammadi Codices and other places because all these things are connected once you have the underlying key to unlock the riddle of it all. And that's what Johnny and I have been bringing forth. We are confirming witness to one another of the, really, the secret of secrets, as we've covered it so many times with so many different things, with everything as far as Genesis and everything going forth. Uh, final comment, brother. Okay, on your screen, if anyone has an opportunity to look at Ouroboros picture B4, it's one of the most profound images you'll ever see. It's a mystery of all human existence right there on her stomach. There's the Ouroboros surrounding two twins, one right side up, one upside down. The upside down one I wrote Cain on, the right side up one I wrote Abel on. That is your condition. That is the entire system.